So you're the creator of Coca-Cola in the late 1800s. More specifically, your name is John Pemberton, an ex-soldier in the American Civil War. Injured in battle, you develop a crippling morphine addiction. And after decades of poverty and illness, you finally decided to find a cure and started a business in 1884. So logically, the best way to cure your addiction and become rich is by using cocaine. Um, Coca was the most interesting, actually, because I thought, you know, it's called Coca-Cola, so does it have cocaine in it? Um, and so I went back to look at that, and turns out, yeah, you know, trace amounts back still to, in the beginning. You see, in 19th century America, cocaine and the coca leaves it was made from were not illegal. They were actually pretty popular. In the late 1800s, coca leaves and cocaine were seen as medicinal, and everyone was using it. And one man named Angelo Mariani was making a fortune from it. He made a coca wine called Vin Mariani, which was basically red wine mixed with insane amounts of coca. Queen Victoria, President Ulysses S. Grant, Thomas Edison, and even two popes were raving fans of this coca wine. So you, a broke war veteran pharmacist, decided that the best way to make money is to create a knockoff of an already popular product. You wouldn't have to do any of the marketing yourself because Vin Mariani had already done the work for you. And plus, regular people couldn't really afford the coca wine that elites were drinking. So you launched your own version of it. Pemberton's French wine coca nerve tonic. It was a near exact imitation of Vin Mariani. It still had the coca in it, except for one other thing, cola nuts, which contain caffeine and in your opinion, it set your product apart from the rest. So you started selling, and you marketed your French coca wine as the end all be all. It could cure opiate addiction, upset stomachs, headaches, and other health problems. There was nothing this miracle cocaine infused tonic couldn't do, according to you of course. But then prohibition hit Georgia. And by 1886, most alcohol production and sales came to a standstill in the states, which meant no one was allowed to buy your new and very popular products because of the alcohol, not the coca. But interestingly, the reason that cocaine became taboo and why it got pulled from the drink had nothing to do with national laws in the country, which was so interesting when I was studying it. It had everything to do with racism, actually, in the South, because there was a concern that Cocaine was contributing to black crime in Atlanta. But instead of just giving up, you simply changed up the marketing for the products, took out the alcohol, kept the coca, added carbonated water, and added a lot of sugar. Like over five pounds of sugar per gallon of syrup. What started as a coca wine became a coca and cola nut syrup, not a full-blown soda like we know today just yet. And boom, Coca-Cola was born. Marketed as the temperance drink, the temperance movement was a term used for the anti-alcohol crowd. Your new Coca-Cola syrup could be sold to pharmacies, who then mixed it with carbonated water before serving. Since cola nuts contain caffeine, it served to only make the drink even more popular and addictive. And not only did switching to water save your product from being banned, it made it a whole lot cheaper and more accessible to the everyday kind of person. The average worker would get off a long day of backbreaking work and head to their local pharmacy for a cold drink. During these local alcohol bans, pharmacies were the new politically correct bars. Unfortunately for you, not everyone liked this new Coca-Cola beverage. It reminded them of the good old days when alcohol was still around. So in your first year, you only sold 600 gallons of syrup. Sure, it was a good start, but it was nowhere near enough to repay the investments people made into your business. And in 1887, you were right back to where you started, looking for a way to make your new Coca-flavored drink profitable. But then, you die. No, seriously, John Pemberton died on August 16th, 1888, before he could see his drink become one of America's greatest success stories. A drug addict as a founder, a failing syrup business, and a company on the verge of bankruptcy. That was Coca-Cola near the end of the 1800s. So how did a failing company with a morphine-addicted owner become one of the biggest, most profitable businesses in the world, worth more than $87 billion and employing over 700,000 people? The history of Coca-Cola only gets stranger from here. One of Coca-Cola's biggest marketing tactics are video ads. I'm sure you've seen at least one ad for Coke on TV or YouTube. The problem is, making professional videos is pretty difficult and expensive. You need stock video footage, pictures, music, sound effects, animations, the list just keeps going on and on. But what if there was one place where you could instantly download all those assets for one single affordable subscription? Well, that's where Storyblocks comes in, today's video sponsor. 
Unlike other sites, Storyblocks doesn't make you pay per video or assets. Instead, you pay one affordable subscription every month for unlimited downloads of everything you might need to make pro-level edits like this. And if you're new to video editing, Storyblocks even has an easy intuitive video editor that's included in your subscription. It lets you easily add Storyblocks content directly into your project and lets you export your video into all the popular formats. And they even have customizable templates for you to start out with. So if you're looking to make great videos for your business or personal brand, you can get started by going to storyblocks.com slash jaketrain right now to sign up for their unlimited all access plan. There's no commitment and you can cancel whenever you want. That's storyblocks.com slash jaketrain with the link below. John Pemberton's morphine addiction eventually killed him in 1888. Apparently, mixing morphine and coca together was not all that good for your health. But before he died, a man named Asa Candler bought a controlling stake in Coca-Cola for around $3,000, or around $86,000 in today's money. By 1891, Candler was his sole proprietor. As Asa Candler, you had a difficult road ahead of you. Marketing and growing the business wasn't going to be easy, but luckily you were the man to do it. With a near-perfect recipe created by Pemberton, all you had to do was focus on marketing. But this was the 1800s. No one knew what Coca-Cola was, and there weren't any TVs or social media influencers to promote your products. So you had to do it the old-fashioned way. And to do that, you spent thousands of dollars plastering the new Coca-Cola logo on anything the company could get its hands on. Suddenly, the logo was printed, painted, and stamped on everything from wallets to barn walls and Coca-Cola wall calendars. In Atlanta, Georgia, you couldn't walk down the street without staring down at least one Coca-Cola ad. But that just wasn't enough to boost sales. Advertising just couldn't make up for the fact that there were hundreds of different syrups on the market, and no one knew what yours tasted like. So you came up with a better idea. Free samples. As the owner of Coca-Cola, you contacted every major pharmacy in the area and asked them for the names of their top 50 customers, an early form of buying leads. Then you sent each of those customers a coupon for a free glass of Coca-Cola. Like today, people in the 19th century also loved getting free stuff, and you knew that if they could just taste how deliciously addictive your new drink was, they would be customers for life. And you were right. Within less than a decade, Coca-Cola was selling a quarter of a million gallons of syrup a year. But then, just like the prohibition on alcohol, in the early 1900s, cocaine and coca leaves were now the targets. Bring home the coke, bring home the coke. Everybody's happy when you bring home the coke. That real great taste leaves you so refreshed. Coca-Cola puts you at your sparkling best. The legal use of cocaine increased by 700% between 1890 and 1902. By 1901, 1 1.8 million pounds of coca leaves were imported into the US. People were literally going crazy for the stuff. But then, just a year later, the government started turning against cocaine and coca. The problem was that by 1898 alone, Coca-Cola was already eating up more than 59,000 pounds of coca leaves to produce the syrup. And it was only going up from there. In 1902, Georgia banned cocaine distribution, and a lot of other states followed their example. Then in 1903, the New York Times published an expose that linked cocaine to an increase in crime. In the racially fueled South, stories of African Americans becoming criminals because they used cocaine were the talk of the town. So you, Asa Candler, a devout Christian, decided to do what's best for your conscience, and obviously your business, and remove the coca from the Coca-Cola formula. The only problem was, removing coca from the syrup would completely change the taste of the drink. Facing a corporate disaster, you found a way to preserve the taste it was so famous for. de coca leaves, or coca leaf extract that didn't have the cocaine in it. This new cocaine-free coca extract became part of what the company calls merchandise number no. 5. One of the codes used to describe the company's secret formula that was made to intentionally sound big and unassuming. The new bans on cocaine meant that only two companies in the US were allowed to import and process coca leaves, Merck of Rahway and Maywood Chemical Works in New Jersey. In other words, the US just granted a monopoly on coca leaves to just two companies. Because of this, Coca-Cola became completely reliant on Maywood to make their new de extract. But by the 1920s, the trade in coca had become so restrictive that you questioned your company's future. By the 1920s, Coca-Cola had become a massive corporation and a big part of American culture. It was everywhere, and they had a lot of money at their disposal. So you did what any other million dollar company does when the government comes knocking. You bribe them so they go away, also known as lobbying. Led by the National Association of Retail Druggists, your lobbying campaign succeeded. 
Section 6 of something called the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act was created, which regulated opiate and coca products. And Section 6 allowed the use of decoconized coca leaves and any other form of coca that doesn't contain cocaine to be used in products. And since your company was the only one that actually used coca for flavor, Section 6 eventually got the nickname Coca-Cola Joker. Officials may have said that they did it to allow trade and economic growth, but deep down everyone knew, there was no way you were going to go up against the corporate giant that is Coca-Cola. With free reign to use as much coca as you want, you ran into the next problem. Supply. The Maywood Chemical Company just couldn't keep up with your demands for more than 200,000 pounds of coca leaves every year. So like any good businessman, you started looking at your options. And in 1928, Coca-Cola and Maywood started a coca extraction plant in Peru. It produced 4,000 pounds of coca extract and 18 kilograms of pure cocaine. And since cocaine sales weren't illegal outside of America, those 18 kilos were sold for $1,000. Yes. Coca-Cola and Maywood were literally selling cocaine, not coca leaves, outside of the U.S. But then the State Department got involved and threatened to take away Maywood's license to import coca legally, and the plan was abandoned. After that failed attempt of making coca extract outside the U.S., you finally got what you wanted in the first place, an increase in how much coca Maywood could import. The 1930 Porter Act increased the limit on how many special leaves used in coca-flavored drinks could be imported. But Coke needed actually so much flavoring. There's a special exemption in our laws for what are called special leaves from Peru. And they're special because they're allowed to come into the United States exclusively, basically, to create the flavoring extract for Coca-Cola. And you were back on track. Suddenly, Maywood had access to so much Coca that they plan on selling the extract to other companies as well. Now, this was a major problem. Coca made your drink special. It was something that you had and no one else could get their hands on. If other companies started making coca-flavored drinks, you would lose business. Your competitive edge would be at stake. So you threatened Maywood that if they ever sold coca to anyone else, you would drop their business entirely. And it worked. Maywood agreed to stick to your terms. And since they had a legal monopoly on the import of coca and you were their only customer, Coca-Cola effectively cemented its monopoly on coca-flavored drinks. Basically, Coke has this exclusive right to bring in coca leaves into the United States. This is what Pepsi, we were talking about Pepsi earlier, they wanted access. You know, it's one of the reasons why Coke, you know, they have a unique flavor, right? They have something that no one else can get. Well, if everyone had access to coca leaves, you know, the price of coca leaves might be pretty high. Because they only have access to that leaf, they get a, a great deal on the price of coca leaves because of international laws that ban it, by the way, that were in part brokered by Coca-Cola. By now, Coca-Cola was a globally recognized brand, but overseas operations were nothing compared to what you sold in the US. And that all changed when World War II hit. When World War II came along, you saw the opportunity to expand like never before. If you could show that Coca-Cola was a patriot, that Coke supported the troops in their fight against evil, you could win the hearts of the American public like never before. So you joined the war effort. As the chairman of Coke, you went to the government and promised to give every single soldier a cold bottle of Coca-Cola for just 5 cents. Now at 5 cents a bottle, you take a loss on every bottle sold. However, if a soldier goes through the toughest battles of his life, he goes through hell and back, he gets back to his base, he's exhausted, and he just wants to wind down and take his mind off of things, and you're there to serve him a delicious, thirst-quenching drink at a steep discount to boost his morale, do you honestly think he's ever gonna buy any other soda when he gets back home, for himself, his family, or his friends? Not a chance. And it worked. When soldiers were asked what three things could boost their morale, they said cigarettes, candy, and Coca-Cola. When Eisenhower went to the troops and said, what can we do to boost morale and to uh, get you through the war, they asked for three things. They asked for cigarettes, they asked for candy, and they asked for Coca-Cola. President Eisenhower even wrote to you, asking to set up mobile bottling plants in Europe. In 1944 alone, Coke made $25 million in profits from selling under a military contract. And wherever soldiers went, Coca-Cola was the perfect drink to share with the locals. So effectively, the US military became your biggest ever sales force, spreading your product all over the world. 
The drink was so sought after that even Nazi Germany wanted Coke. But you know, selling Coca-Cola to Germany would be like treason or something, and go against your patriotic brand image. So you invented Fanta to sell to the Germans, making money off of both sides of the war, while simultaneously slipping under the conscience of the American public. I'm playing both sides so that I always come out on top. By the end of the war, Coca-Cola sold an estimated 10 billion bottles of Coke to the troops, and Coke became as American as it could get. But this massive expansion came with its own problems. There are times every day as you work or you play when a pause would be welcome to you. And it's then that you find the bright thought in your mind that only a Coke will do. Business exploded after World War II. You had enough coca because of the monopoly, and you had enough sugar because of the better markets after the war. But there was one last supply problem, caffeine. So the coca was fun and interesting and wild, but then I got to caffeine, and that's what led to this. So like, where does the caffeine come from? I tried to Google it, as one does, and I was like, where does the caffeine come from? And I couldn't figure it out. At first, using cola nuts seemed like a good idea, but they grew far away, there wasn't enough, and the caffeine in them wasn't really any different from the caffeine in things like coffee and tea. So without a steady supply of caffeine, your Coca-Cola wouldn't have the same energizing kick. So you decide to change your caffeine source to something cheaper and in greater supply, tea leaves. In the 1900s, the world was in a tea drinking craze. Westerners all wanted the best, highest quality tea to drink, which meant a lot of damaged and broken leaves were being left to rot in warehouses. And what did all these tea leaves have in common? They all contained caffeine. So in 1904, a little known company that you may have heard of called Monsanto was formed. And Monsanto offered Coca-Cola caffeine made from these old damaged tea leaves. And once again, you were back in action. For Coca-Cola, there would be no Monsanto. Really? Yes. When Monsanto, this chemical company from St. Louis that started in 1901, it was like barely getting by. It, it was, you know, the, the American chemical industry almost didn't exist. The Germans were really in control. They run, ran the organic chemistry. We were getting all of our chemicals from overseas. And so they needed a big contract. And so their initial buyer was Coca-Cola. And they sold Coca-Cola two things. They sold them saccharin, the artificial sweetener, which ultimately comes from coal tar, we can talk about that, and then caffeine. So basically, they took tea leaves that were broken and damaged around the world, like on, at tea exchanges, like the garbage of the tea trade, and they realized no one was gonna consume that, so it was just waste. And they basically swept that stuff up and processed out the caffeine from the garbage, from the waste tea, tea leaves. That contract with Coca-Cola would be the initial boost Monsanto needed to set it on track to become what many consider one of the most evil corporations in the world. The company responsible for Agent Orange, PCBs, herbicides, genetically modified foods, seed licensing, and more. But the fact of the matter is that Monsanto is not that different from other hyper-successful companies and people. They're just a lot better at getting away with extreme stuff. See, there are two sides to every hyper-successful person. What they tell the general public about their success, it's all about hard work, consistency, perseverance, and what they actually think and do behind closed doors when the cameras are off. If my competitor were drowning, I'd walk over and I'd put a hose right in his mouth. The problem is you are never going to learn any of this unless you are already in successful circles. Why? Because if the elite didn't hide this from the public, they would be pillaged and sent to the guillotine. Or at the bare minimum, they would have more competition to deal with. You're also never going to learn this from your friends, family, or teachers. For the same reason why you're not going to learn how to lose weight from an overweight person. And you're not going to learn it from some business professor, because again, it's politically incorrect, and they're probably broke. That's why I'm starting a new series called Things Hidden from the Masses where you're going to learn everything they will never teach you in business school in feature-length 40-minute-plus documentaries every month. And in the first documentary, you're going to learn how the Monsanto Empire was built, the company that owns the world's food supply. These are going to be some of the darkest, most Machiavellian videos I have ever made. Imagine these videos taken to a further extreme. And just like Monsanto, I also prefer not to be cancelled. So we are not going to be releasing these to the public. All you have to do, if you want to get this education they would never teach you in business school, is click the join button below, right next to the subscribe button. And unlike an MBA, I'm not going to charge you $55 to $161,000 to learn this stuff. Nope, just $5 a month for longer documentaries of the videos you love that you would not be able to see anywhere else. And this $5 a month is just to cover the cost to produce these videos. Give it a try for a month, and if you don't think this knowledge is worth it, email me and I will personally refund you the money. So pause the video and click the join button below right now.
So back to Coca-Cola. Eventually, not even Monsanto could provide enough caffeine from tea leaves in decaf coffee. So you asked Monsanto to do the impossible, create synthetic caffeine. And as expected, Monsanto came back with a solution. Caffeine made from the chemicals in coal tar. Yes, actual coal tar, a byproduct of processed coal. The fossil fuel industry was booming, so naturally there was a lot of the stuff lying around. And sure, people might object to drinking something with coal tar chemicals in it, so you just keep it vague. Seems logical that they're thinking is, wait a minute, consumers are never going to ask where their caffeine comes from. Look at everyone I've ever talked to. No one knows right. where the caffeine comes from, right? And if you go to their website, it's great. It says, we source our caffeine from tea leaves. So that waste tea leaf story is still part of it. Coffee beans, uh, decaf coffee, and then appropriate sources. Appropriate. <laughs> Which I <Pea>. love. <laughs> as long as Coke tastes good, nobody will care what it's made of. And with the final supply chain problem solved, there was nothing holding Coca-Cola back from world domination. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. I like to teach the world to sing, sing with me. In 2012, Coca-Cola started selling its products in Burma. This meant that there are only two countries left in the world that don't sell Coke, Cuba and North Korea. Researchers working in the South Pole can get an icy Coke to enjoy at sub-zero temperatures. You can stop for a Coca-Cola at the Mount Everest base camp, and Coke even went to space in 1985. In total, around 1.9 million servings of Coke are sold a day. That's one in four people who drink Coke at least once a day. Today, they have more than 500 brand names under the Coca-Cola umbrella and the company stands as the sixth largest in the world after brands like Apple and Google, being valued at over $87 billion. And it all started with a morphine-addicted war veteran that wanted to rip off a coca-infused wine. Finally chipped ice. Bubbling carbonated water. Yes, people talked about it, tried it, and even then learned the happy enjoyment to be found in the pause that refreshes. So I have to say, this is by far one of my favorite videos I've done so far, so let me know what you guys thought about it in the comments below. As you can see, we are still in the middle of moving around, so excuse the uh, poor background. If you're new here, we make video essays, documentaries, just like this one every single week for free. So if you enjoyed this one, you're definitely gonna like the other ones, so click that subscribe button below. And click that join button below too. But that's gonna wrap it up. Thank you so much for being part of the Watch to the End Club. Watching you to the end is by far the best way to help out the YouTube algorithm, so I really appreciate it. Keep sharpening that mind, stay dangerous out there, and I will see you guys in the next one.